Hey, what's going on? My name is Nate. And, you know, I'm one of those people who have a love-hate relationship with the media. Sometimes they do good things, sometimes they do bad things. But in the case of the women's U.S. national team and their lawsuit for equal pay, the media, the media has misled you. And not only have they misled you a little bit, I think this is one of the worst times that the media has thrown up horrible, horrible information making you sympathetic to one side. But I believe when you hear the facts, you're going to understand why the women's lawsuit, the U.S. women's soccer team's lawsuit was thrown out. And you are probably going to agree that it should have been thrown out. All right, let's just start this off right. If you are new here, my name is Nate. I'm an attorney, lawyer, YouTuber. I do videos about multiple different topics, usually with a nice little type of law flair to it. So I call my show Hood Law because it is a law with like a nice little urban twist to it. Now, if you haven't yet, hit that subscribe button, give me a like, and something new to my channel right now is that little join button. You can become a member of this channel and help support me in what I do. I would really appreciate it and it helps me keep the lights on over here. So if you're interested and if you have if you have the funds, I think it's two, three dollars a month, grab a channel membership and you'll see all the nice little perks that come with it. I would appreciate it. But now on to the story. Now, as you know, I used to be a law school lecturer, right? I was a prosecutor and I used to teach at a law school. I had students, I gave grades, the whole shenanigans. The way I used to always tell my students to break down a case is start with the facts because the facts are going to let you know what the issues are. It's going to let you know what the law is. So we will start with the facts first from the period that the lawsuit covers 2015 to 2019, the U S women's national team was paid approximately $24 million that averaged about $220,000 per game. And they played 111 games. In contrast, the men's national team was paid about $18 million, and that averaged about $212,000 per game. They played 87 games. Now, the court says, based on this evidence, it appears that the women's national team did not make more money than the men's national team solely because they played more games. Rather, the women's national team both played more games and made more money per game. Now, the first fact that we have to understand is that U.S. soccer negotiates with the women's team and the men's team separately for contracts. So it's not one contract for all. It's a separate negotiation between the women's team and a separate negotiation between the men's team. Now, in May 2016, U.S. soccer offered the women's national team the same contract as they did the men's. And the women's team rejected it. So U.S. soccer said, Let's pay the men and the women identically. And that offer was rejected by the women's team. So this isn't about equal pay because that was offered. It was offered in 2016, three years before they brought this lawsuit. So they were offered, they were offered equal pay. They rejected it. Now, why did they reject it? Well, the court says they preferred an agreement involving some elements of guaranteed compensation. So they rejected the men's deal and said, we'd rather a deal that give us some guaranteed compensation. Now, this is a direct quote from the opinion. In reality, the men's national team and the women's national team bargained for different agreements which reflected their different preferences and that the women's national team explicitly rejected the terms they are now seeking to retroactively impose on themselves. So they were offered the men's contract they said, we'll pay you like the men. They rejected it. And now they're coming to the court saying we want the men's deal. So it's going to lead you to say, well, what are the agreements? What are the differences and how are they the same? Let's look at the men's deal. The men had a play to pay agreement. Now, what this means is that each player is not compensated unless they participate in a training camp and they have to play in the games. Now, the men's collective bargaining agreement had no obligation of any matches, any amount of members on the team, whether they'll play in a tournament. It had no obligations to U.S. soccer to do anything or hold any events. Now, for the men's national team, players 
don't get any salary. They only get performance bonuses based on performance. How does that work? Well, if they have a game which is known as a friendly, these are competitions just, you know, hey, let's just have a friendly match. If they win, they get $17,000 per player. If they tie, they get up to $8,000 per player. And if they lose, each player gets five grand. Again, that's it. You play, you win, you get paid, you lose, you get nothing. Now, let's say the men's team makes it to the World Cup, which they didn't last time, but let's say they made it to the World Cup. Then each player on the men's team will get a $68,000 bonus. Now, if they just qualify and make it to the qualifying rounds, U.S. soccer will give the team $2.5 million for each player to split evenly. If they make it to the semifinals, that amount turns into $5.5 million for each player to split evenly. And if they win the World Cup, which the U.S. hasn't done in a while, they'll split $9 million equally between the whole team. Now, it is important to note here, there is no guaranteed compensation. If a man on the men's team does not play in a game, he's not going to get compensated. If a man on the U.S. team is cut early from the team, he will not get compensated. You play, you get paid. You don't play, you don't get paid. Simple enough. That is the men's collective bargaining agreement. So what about the women? What about the women's national team? Now, Mind you, they were offered this same deal that the men got and rejected it. They said, we don't want that. So what did they get instead? Well, first, U.S. soccer must have at a minimum 20 contracted players on the women's national team. And each one of those 20 players must have a salary of $100,000. So now they are salaried employees. They're making $100,000. So 20 women, $100,000 each. Now, if any of those players play in the National Women's Soccer League, that team has to have 11 players. And if you are a tier one player, you receive a base salary of $67,000. If you're a tier two player, you receive a base salary of $62,000. So you have the women's national team. If you make that team, you get a $100,000 salary. Boom, you're good. And if you don't, if you make that team and you make the Women's National Soccer League, you go to that soccer league, you get $67,000 if you're a top tier player. And if you're a lower tier player, you get $62,000. Now, let's talk about friendlies. There are bonuses that they get for wins. Now, this structure is identical to the men's structure, except obviously it's going to be less money because the women have gotten paid already. They got they get $100,000 salaries. We have the men. If you don't play, you get nothing. Now, for friendlies, women can make up to $8,500 for a win. And they don't make any money, any bonus for any ties or any losses. So they only make money if they win. And again, that could be up to 8,500 bucks. Now in the World Cup, that changes a little bit. They automatically get $3,000 per win and $500 for a tie, no matter what. They get a bonus of $37,000 just for qualifying. And they also get a roster bonus of $37,000. Also results matter in the World Cup because if they place in first place like they did last time, each player gets $110,000. If they place second, they get $50,000. If they place third, they get $25,000. If the female players from the national team want to, they can go on a tour and that pay for the tour can range from anywhere from $250,000 to $350,000 for the post World Cup tour. And, and there is a $230,000 signing bonus. Again, these are facts from the court documents. There's also a revenue sharing piece of it where for every ticket sold during these events, the women's team gets $1.50 per ticket. So if you got X amount of people at the stadium, $1.50 per ticket is going to the women who are playing on the field. And there's also one last piece of compensation they can get, which is $5,000 bonuses if their team wins the She Believes tournament or the Four Nations tournament. And that's only for the first place team. But that's not all. The women's contract also provides for severance benefits, injury protection, health, be health insurance, dental insurance, vision insurance, pregnancy pay, guaranteed rest time, child care assistance, partnership bonuses, 
if the revenue goes up. Annual payments in exchange for U.S. soccer's commercial use of the player's likeness and a clause that U.S. soccer shall use good faith effort to schedule a minimum number of games for the women's national team. Now, the men get none of this. The men get no severance pay, no injury protection, no health, no dental, no vision, no pregnancy, none of that. None of the fringe benefits, the men get absolutely none, nothing. And they don't get the base salaries that the women get. The women's national team alleges that U.S. soccer discriminates against its female players by paying them less than their male players on the male's national team and subjecting them to unequal working conditions. The plaintiffs move for summary judgment that U.S. soccer has violated both the Equal Protection Act and Title VII. The defendants, they then also asked the court for summary judgment. So now you know the facts and now you know the issue. And the issue is simple. The women on the women's national team is saying, we deserve to be paid identical to men, even though they've gotten paid more. And even though they said they did not want to get paid the men's pay schedule, they rejected that, remember? So this is what they're going to court asking for. We want to be paid the same bonus schedule as the men, but we don't want to be, but we want to keep all those fringe benefits that we get, but we want to get paid the same bonus schedule as the men. What law are we talking about? We're talking about the Equal Protection Act. Now the Equal Protection Act, it forbids pay discrimination on the basis of sex, but the women's national team has to show three things. One, they perform substantially equal work to the men's players which I think they did. They went out there and played. Yes, they, they did the same amount of work. It was under similar working conditions. I think that's easy to show. And that the men's national team players were played more for that same work. Now, this is where the court's attention went to. And the court says it only is going to address this third element because I think the other two are, are simple, right? They did the work. They, they, they were there, yeah. Okay, and it was the same working conditions. But this number three, that's what they got to show. The court says the plaintiffs must show that the defendant pays wages to the women's national team players at a rate less than the rate in which it pays wages to the employees of the opposite sex. That's what they're talking about. That's what the plaintiffs must show. Now, obviously, it's going to come out. Well, what are wages, right? What are wages? Well, the court and the law kind of list them out what wages are. Wages are any form, any and all forms of compensation. Um, for that time period. So whether the they're paid periodically or deferred to a later date, they count. Um, whether they're called wages or not, they still count. If you get a salary, if you get profit sharing, if you get an expense account, monthly minimum income, bonuses, uniform cleaning allowance, hotel accommodations, use of company car, gasoline allowances, all these things are included in the calculation. Other things that are included are things that are known as fringe benefits. For instance, things like medical insurance, hospital insurance, accident insurance, life insurance, retirement benefits, profit sharing and bonuses, leave, and other such concepts. So all of these are added up to say how much of this are you getting paid? This is a piece, this whole pie, it's the whole pie. You can't just say, I'm gonna take out these other things that the company's paying for. You say, well, if they're giving me all of this, how much is that worth and is it equal to my counterparts? Now, the argument for the women's national team is that none of the French benefits should be calculated. It should, they should only do this calculation based on the bonuses. Here's what the court says. The history of negotiation between the parties demonstrates that the women's national team rejected an offer to be paid under the same pay-to-play structure as the men's national team and that the women's national team was willing to forgo higher bonuses for other benefits, such as a greater base compensation and a guarantee of a higher number of contracted players. Accordingly, plaintiffs cannot now retroactively deem their collective bargaining agreement worse than the men's national team's collective bargaining agreement by reference to what they would have made if they would have been paid under the men's national team's pay-to-pay -pay structure when they themselves rejected such structure close quote the court then goes on to say then goes on to say when one of the defining features of the women's national team collective bargaining agreement is its guarantee that players will be compensated regardless of whether they play a match or not 
This stands in stark contrast to the men's national team's collective bargaining agreement under which players are only compensated if they are called onto camp and play in a particular match. If they don't play, they don't get paid. That's not true for the women, but that's true for the men. The court has made it very clear. The women's national team was offered to be paid like the men and they rejected that deal and negotiated something they liked. For those reasons, the judge threw out their case. Well, he didn't throw out the full case. He threw out their equal protection issue because number one, they're getting paid the same as the men now anyway. Number two, they negotiated that agreement that they're playing under now. And number three, this wasn't something that was discriminatory in nature. They were offered, they were offered the same pay structure as their male counterparts. And so they didn't want it. They wanted this. They wanted the child care. They wanted the insurance. They wanted the lifetime annuities or whatever they, they're getting. And now they want to renege. They want to say, well, we want, we still want to keep all that. We still want to keep all the child care benefits and all that other stuff we still want to get. We still want to keep that. But we also want what the men get to. This isn't discrimination. This is being played. They're trying to play the public. Let's just call it what it is. This team is trying to play the public for fools. I think if people knew what the circumstances were around this case, you would feel less inclined to be on the side of the women's national team. Especially now that we know they were offered the same deal as the men and rejected it and then negotiated this deal got paid more under this deal and now are upset that they say, well, we could have made more under the men's deal. So we'd rather have that deal now. And again, they are asking, they are asking, they are asking to keep all the fringe benefits and everything, all the stuff the men doesn't don't get. They want to keep all that, but they want to be paid just like the men's structure. Are they going to give up their hundred thousand dollar salaries? The minimum 20 players have to get. Are they going to give up the $67,000 base salaries if they play in that league? Are they going to give up all those fringe benefits? No. The media, the politicians who've all kind of made this argument that the women's national team is being paid unfairly have lied to you. You have been fooled. And don't get me wrong. There are situations where women are not being paid as much as men for doing the same job. There are situations out there. That is true. This is not one of them. This are a privileged few trying to take advantage of their position, of their notoriety. They can say, we're not getting paid like the men and pretend that that's a true statement. But now that you know the facts, what do you think? Do you think the women's national team should have won this lawsuit? Do you think they're being treated unfairly? Do you think this is a really an equal protection discrimination based on sex? Now that you know the facts, now you know the facts. Let me know what you think in the comment section. When I read this case, I was so upset because I was one of those people who looked at this lawsuit initially when, it, when I first heard about it and thought that this was sad. How can the women be paid less? You know, they're winning. You know, this, 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 even though I understood, you know, FIFA for the men, they make something like $4 billion a year where for the women, they're only making a hundred billion dollars. I'm like, they could do something more for these women. You know, it, this is, this is just wrong. The men's team suck. You know, I watch the women's soccer. I like women's soccer, but guess what? Come to find out that's not the case. The case, the fact of the matter is U.S. soccer said, we'll pay you both the same. We'll pay you both exactly the same. And the women rejected that offer. The women's national team got what they asked for and now they want to pull on the heartstrings of americans and say they're being discriminated against and that is not the case it just isn't leave your comments below let me know how you think my name is nate lawyer youtuber and i'm out peace